Hello everyone, this is Luke Johnson from Noetic, the humanities teaching platform which you can beta test at noetic.online right now. I'm back with Robert Schutt to discuss Soren Kierkegaard's My Point of View as an author. Did I get the whole title right? It's a oh, long well, it's title. a little bit more, and then it's colon a report to history. Yeah. What's the, what's the whole proper title? I, I'm Okay, it's... I'm, the point of view for my work as an author, colon, a report to history. Yes, that's right. I have, my book is in the basement. <laughs> so, uh, this is our second installment of it. Bob will be in our, our instructor today. Um, I'm excited to talk about this. Uh, Bob, where are we picking up today? Well, we're picking up on lesson three. Uh, we established last week that uh, Kierkegaard is discussing with us the idea of being an aesthetic writer and being a religious writer. And which of the two is he? Is he both? Was he an aesthetic writer who became a religious writer? And uh, he's kind of giving us the, the answer here, as we'll see. But this relates to Christendom. Uh, and the kind of very interesting, the two phases of Christendom, if, if we can call them phases or stages or whatever, where we take an, an aesthetic stage or the explanation of Christianity and a, and a religious stage of Christianity. And I think that'll come clear to us as we discuss that between ourselves a little bit more. Uh, we'll spend a little time on that. Uh, so in lesson three, he starts us out telling us the illusion that religion can give us is that it's something that we can put off until we get older, okay? And th that youth doesn't recognize the seriousness of the age or the seriousness of eternity. Uh, the, the youth, as we were youthful at one time, right, Luke? Uh, the youth are drawn in... I'm, I'm, I'm not dead yet, Bob. I'm 37. <laughs> hey, there, do you recall that scene from uh, Monty Python? No, I don't. Where it's like, oh... Old woman, can you tell me how to get to Camelot or whatever? He's like, I'm not old. I'm 37. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a man. My name's Dennis. Yeah. He says that the youth are drawn into the aesthetic lifestyle and are suspicious of the religious person. And I'm thinking, is this rightfully so? It, it appears that it is. It appears that many of the youth are suspicious about older religious people. But it used to be that the elderly were looked up to as being wise in the old civilizations, uh, especially when it came to religion. Uh, do we really see this today anymore, I, I kind of ask. Uh, so I thought I'd just quickly ask you, Luke, do you, do you see in your environment, in your uh, lifestyle out there on the East Coast, that the elderly are still held up to a uh, like a uh, a respectful level of knowledge, or do you think that that's just to kind of disappeared from our society? No, I think we I think we, there is great discrimination against the elderly, and uh, I do wh whatever. Uh, I'm not gonna. I guess I'm not really gonna hide. It's a conspiracy, right? There is there is a program with it within work of our society to make. Uh, people past a certain age look senile, to look dumb, to look out of it, uh, to look like they suffer from Alzheimer's or something like that. It's to create a stereotype. I guess the, the expression is ageist. So if you can write off anyone, I guess, who's beyond retirement, or like 66 or whatever the age is for retirement these days, um, you, you don't have to listen to them. They're just an old fuddy-duddy that has nothing important to say. So I think our culture has become uh, radically autonomous in that way and is not deferential to our elders at all. Um, I think it's a big problem. And, you know, I think it's also unfortunate that I think, you know, maybe some people who are of that age, not you, definitely not you, um, haven't have, I guess, embraced the lack of responsibility for bringing up the young, you know, like that, that they don't have that responsibility to pass on wisdom from past ages or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so have gladly like handed it over to experts or something like that. But I've always, I've, to be honest, I've always appreciated the, the deference to ancestors that are in like sort of Native American traditions and stuff like that. It seems to be still alive and well there. Um, but at least in modern American culture, I mean, through TV and movies, I mean, old people are made to made to look like they've lost their minds, and I, I and I I just think it's a tragedy. 
Well, I, I wonder if it's an influence of technology, because in technology, anything that's old is bad, and anything that's brand new is the greatest thing that's ever happened. And I wonder if we kind of visit that on people, because it's kind of like a way of life, a mode of life. We learn the, the new is the better, not the old. Right. You always want the, the brand new model, the newest iPhone and this. And I think that definitely plays into it. Um, I think there's been this great idea, too, that like uh, that 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 truth is is not historical. Right. That anything worth knowing is not really embedded in history as well. Right. That true. Um, that 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 people who live through certain epochs in history have nothing really to communicate us to us about our present age. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we don't have to listen to people who live through certain wars or whatever. And guess what happens when we don't listen? We go and get ourselves in new wars. Yeah. <laughs> now he says, uh, but what he says here is that there's a tendency of older people to take refuge in religion. So one might say that the aesthetic belongs to the young and the religious to the old, if we were going to kind of split them up by age group. Um, and I, I kind of asked why this is so. Is it because that the youth are crave the, f the the things of the flesh more strongly than the elderly? Uh, I don't even want to say elderly. Ju just that the older may be more mature, uh, and that it overcomes the desire for holiness. Is it because the young search for fun and pleasure, or more pleasure seeking? But the old start to get more serious about life because they get closer to the end and they might be more willing to seek for a, a life of holiness. And Yeah, I think, there, I think there's a lot to that. I think like the younger you are, the more married you are to your primordial instincts. So you're going to be doing a lot more thinking with your, your hormones than with your neurons. Um, so there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, just biologically, I think, uh, young people, um, aren't as rational as say older people are. And I think the more, to, in my very biased view, the more rational you are, you ought to really become more religious. But, uh, there are many rational atheists out there that would disagree with me on that. Um, but the other thing too, is that the society is in such a way that it preaches a forever young mentality or, oh, yeah. um, or to that, that that it's better to die young than to fade away. What's the the Neil Young song, right? It's better to burn out than to fade away. Was he the one who, who wrote that song? There's this whole idea that like when we're young, we're gods and goddesses and the world is ours and we can do anything mm -hmm. and chasing dreams and, you know, you know, be like Jim Morrison and Janis Joplin and Jimi Hendrix and like do everything that you're going to do in your life before you're 27. And then, uh, you know, Maybe you'll overdose, and that was a good life. Yeah, you know, that 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 trope is communicated to a lot of young people. Yeah, yeah, and it's and and that too, I guess, plays against the idea of being deferential to the elders. Mm -hmm. So now we kind of opened up by discussing what the aesthetic and the religious are apart from one another, but now he says we're going to try to look at them side by side, parallel to one another, uh, and he asks. He says that they can exist simultaneously. So usually you go from one stage to the next, but he's, now he's going to say, but wait a second, these stages can go on together simultaneously. People can have thoughts of Christianity and even agree with the theology and the ideology of Christianity. They may think that Jesus loved us and died for us, and etc. all the, the good Christian ideals. They might accept the entire theological program, but at the same time, they defer total commitment until they become older. Uh, and he asks, does this make them like the heathen? Does God's forgiveness become something that we try to exploit, like in Romans? I'm not sure if you're familiar with this verse. It says uh, in Romans 6.1, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So is that kind of how we live our lives today? That uh, we think that grace is uh, what we're looking for from God, and the more sin that we have, the more grace it takes. So we're just bringing out God's grace. I, uh, I, I know it sounds maybe kind of silly, but there are people I've met who actually think that way. So Paul Risley wasn't speaking merely to the... Uh, 
first, second century uh, church. Now, I, go ahead. You're going to Yeah, say and, and, and I, you know, something that I struggle with, right, is, you know, I, I take that verse very seriously. The question then becomes, and you see it a lot with Puritan theologians, is the emphasis of the mortification of the desires, right? Mm-hmm. That they sort of could could acknowledge this the 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 sinful proclivities within us, and then right, how much do you suppress it? How much do you separate from the carnal world? Mm-hmm. And does does Christianity become? And it's not necessarily what the topic of the discussion is today. Does you know, in its extreme form, can Christianity become this sort of suppressive, mortifying religion? And then ought it to, mm-hmm. right? Like, there's of course it can. Mm-hmm. But it's a, it's an interesting theological question about ought it to like I mean you have all these examples of really religious people I mean Kierkegaard himself think about what Kierkegaard deprived himself of yeah right he deprived himself of marriage he deprived himself of you know obviously sex he deprived himself of friendship he deprived himself of enjoying the opera for more than five or ten minutes mm-hmm. there was always this impulse within him to constantly be serving the Lord through his work. And mm-hmm. it was, and, and we talked about last week about how it took great tolls on his, his health. Yeah. And yeah. I can relate to this. I can relate to this. <laughs> now, do you know, I know, I don't know how much you know about Constantine, but Constantine waited until his deathbed before he was baptized for fear that he would commit sin after baptism. <laughs> and the, the question was, in his particular situation, I'd have to ask the question, is killing your wife by drowning because it was reported she committed adultery with her son in, with her son-in-law, her stepson, rather, a sin? Because that's what she was accused of. See, it, 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 history kind of records that Constantine had his wife murdered, or perhaps even did it himself, drowned in a bathtub, because she was committing adultery with her stepson, as so as reported anyway. So Constantine led a kind of interesting, I guess we can use that word, life. But the whole idea of Constantine was that he postponed baptism until the very until his deathbed, because he was afraid that if he was baptized and then he committed a sin, he wouldn't be forgiven for it. So he just kept putting it off until the very end. And he thought if he had gotten baptized and been a serious Christian, then he wouldn't have been able to rule, right? And that's exactly right, yes. Yeah, he couldn't carry on his conquests and whatnot. Couldn't, yeah, couldn't do what a king is supposed to do, uh, or an emperor. So if one could remain young, there would be no need for religion. Is this then the divine purpose of death, perhaps, to make us aware of our need for religion? So is this why when we get older and we become more aware of death we become more concerned about life. Without death, we would just continue on in, in that aesthetic world. So Right, right. We would be kind of like Olympian gods, right? And we would, you know, we would get into petty fights and squabbles and have battles over the Mount, Mount Olympus or whatever. But yeah, that, is really, it, it, that does raise an interesting question, right? Like, like, Presumably, angels have some form of immortality, right? But then we see that that even that comfort in immortality led to the fall, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You know, Lucifer was the anointed cherubim, and he fell. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, I, immortality is a very interesting question. Like, I mean, if we do really take this whole idea of Christianity very seriously, like, and we are saved, and we are experience the beatific vision with with Jesus and God one day. I mean, we too will be immortal. Will we cease to be religious when we have that immortality con- conferred upon us? I I don't think we would. I don't. I think we'll be in that heavenly choir. I think we'll be very excited about it. I think so. So, so it's it, it seems like the realm that the I guess what just to complete the thought, it seems like what matters is the realm the immortality is applied to. Yeah. If the immortality is applied to this realm of earth, then it can make people less religious. But if the immortality is applied applied to subjects that are in heaven, then there's a chance that it makes them more religious. Well, yeah, Paul, matter of fact, in Paul in Romans tells us that uh, the bodies that we have now are made and designed for the temporal world, for mortality. Yeah, but, They're made to decay. But the bodies that we will have 
will be designed for eternity and they'll be immortal bodies. So I think a lot has to do with the uh, uh, the vessel that we that we bear at the time. When we bear an eternal vessel, we won't have to worry about sin the way we do now. They won't be subject to the same kind of temptations. Well, when we have eternal, if we when we have e- eternal vessels, I mean, presumably we'll be able to come face to face with God. It's pretty hard to sin against God if you can if you can look at him. Yeah, you know, we can't really do. You know, we can't really do that right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he says that we have a sense of growing older in time, but not in eternity. Uh, this means that we have no clue about the idea of eternity and how long it will last. It's kind of hard for us to really discuss eternity or perceive it. Uh, we could, you know, we could talk about it and so forth, but really, do we, how much do we understand about eternity? We really don't. It's just kind of a projection of eternity. Uh, Eternity for us, I think, is a projection of the temporal into uh, the future. I like to think about it as like endless perfection. Mm -hmm. Does does that help at all to think of it that way? Yeah, yeah, it it, it does. It gives a different depth of our idea of eternity. Instead of just time, what you're doing is you're bringing in the idea of, of depth, of character which is not usually brought into it. So that, that's very good. Thank you. Uh, do we really take health serious if we believed we would be there for eternity? The implication here is that we would have no spiritual sense of our reality. So if we did believe in the biblical principles that there was a hell, that hell would also be for eternity, that might have an influence on our behavior, on our character, and how, we, how seriously we take life. You think? I think so. <laughs> I mean, just think about think about it from a corporeal sort of perspective, right? From a temporal perspective, yeah. right? Yeah. Like, I'm not I'm not advocating the death penalty, mm-hmm. okay? But just j- this is just a thought experiment, right? Mm-hmm. Like, if there's no death penalty, right? Ver- so we have World A where there's a death penalty, right? And that death penalty is like swiftly applied, mm-hmm. right? So the second that you kill someone, then you are annihilated as well, mm-hmm. right? That's 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 world A. And then world B, there's no death penalty. There's just uh, rehabilitation or something like that, yeah. right? Which world is going to be the world with less crime? Yeah. <laughs> a. The world where... A. Yeah, A. Like, that, that if you knew the second that you took someone else's life there would be retribution visited upon you. Yeah. Right? Now, now if we were to expand that to the idea of retribution being co- applied to you for eternity, yeah. I think we would behave ourselves a little better. And, you know, no matter how you view hell, even if, you, I mean, if we take away the flames and all that out of the picture, because those are, those are just pictures for us anyway, if we just consider it a miserable place... Just think the absence of God. The, uh, yeah. the absence of God. But just think, whatever it is, it's for eternity. I mean, even if you had a thorn in your finger, if you had to have that thorn in your finger for eternity, that's just not the way I want to live in eternity. You know? It well, does. if we're thinking about he- if we're thinking about heaven as being a place of eternal perfection, then hell would be a place of eternal corruption. Yeah. So the just the people you'd be with uh, would should be convincing oh. enough. <laughs> Yeah, if you if you uh, if you need a refresher on that, check out our lesson on Sartre's No Exit. Yes, yes. So he continues to say sometimes the religious elderly are very stern in fault finding of the young. We talked about this just a little bit a little minute ago. This would turn off the youth into thinking that they also have to conform to that type of personality if they want to please God. Sometimes God is brought across like that. That no, God is. You know, he's holding the hammer or the sword or the sickle or something, and you get out of line, and you know that's it that you're done for. Uh, that's not how God operates. But uh, if he's projected like that by the elderly, the youth are going to say, "I don't want to worship a God like that. I don't want to worship a God that's going to be so fault finding and." just constantly punishing me for anything that I do. And that's sometimes unfortunate that some people do have that idea of God. Uh, They've yet to really experience His grace and His forgiveness. And He tells us that the aesthetic, 
uh, works are only a means of communication, his works. Uh, so Kierkegaard kind of jumps in and out of thoughts here. He kind of goes in, he develops that one thought. Now he's jumping out of that a little bit and saying that, you know, the aesthetic works that I've written are a means of communication. Uh, we'll find out that this is a kind of way of preparing his audience for the Christian paradox, which is Christ. So he's, he's kind of trying to stay several steps ahead of the reader. And he analyzes the reader and he says, my readers, in Denmark anyway at this time, uh, is going to be uh, aesthetic. And so how do I get them from the aesthetic to the religious? Uh, <clears throat> I have to kind of manipulate them. So I have to first start out at the aesthetic level to get their attention. We'll talk about this at, as we're going through. He says that his concern is that people won't believe in his method. They won't come to the religious through the aesthetic. So this is kind of like an untested method he's using here. Uh, and, the, and if that's true, then everything he's doing, he says, is a colossal waste of time and his life. If this isn't going to work. So this is his... This is his test. This is his, uh, um, what would we call it, uh, experiment. This is, right? Right. This and is, this is cross to bear. Yeah, yeah, and this is his experiment. If this, if this doesn't work, his whole life is a wasted, waste of time. Uh, but this is always the risk of faith. Faith always has that element of risk to it. Uh, we can never really judge ourselves in this way. Uh, and even Kierkegaard, look at Kierkegaard himself. Uh, his work didn't become recognized until after his death. So maybe he didn't even know, really, whether his method here worked or not before he died. I think he had some sense that it was working. I mean, I think in this book he does refer to the fact that he does have something at this stage in his life, that something that approximates a public. I think he was starting to see it. I don't think he could have anticipated where he, you know, where things are now, but I think he was starting to anticipate that he had a readership, you know. Yeah, uh, his, I think his, he, but I think he knew, yeah. I think he knew he was getting through to some people. So, but his books weren't flying off the shelf, right? No, 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 no. He's much more popular now than he ever was. Absolutely, then, yeah. That's the point I think we need to make. That back in his day, he might have known that he got to a few. But not not as many, hopefully, as he's influenced since his since his death, uh, and and more so now. I think more people are coming to him as they're getting more and more frustrated with uh, the the way that philosophy has has taken them today. Uh, so, what if we tried to save some time? He says, and if we tried to go directly to the religious, what if we didn't bring people first to the aesthetic and go directly to the religious? Uh, such a communicator, he says, is over anxious and uh, to be regarded as religious. One might want to speed up the process so that everyone will know that he's religious. So the true religious man is patient and knows that he needs to first prepare the believer in order to remove his deception. So, in his words, <clears throat> a teacher may uh, a teacher may be able to pass. Uh, on his instruct, pass on his instruction and his knowledge to the student. But the teacher, caught up in his reputation, instead of teaching to a particular lesson and exclaiming that he didn't really understand it, being honest with the student, would never do such a thing because others would find out that he was not fit to become a teacher. So I think what he's saying here, Luke, is that it comes down to ego. The teacher is more caught up with the idea, I'm a teacher, and I'm supposed to know everything, so I can't admit to the pupils, to the students, that I don't know that. So, <laughs> right? so that if they ask a question, he's always got an answer, as clever as it might be, but may not be truthful. Because above everything else, it's not to preserve truth, it's to preserve his reputation. So the person who has a religious character or even a person who's in pursuit of it, cannot endure being regarded as the only person who's not religious. He must be considered by others to be religious. So now he's giving us a false sense of religious. In other words, not the good religious, 
but those right. people who are falsely religious. They see themselves as the most important thing is not that I am religious, is but that you know it. So I have to Right, right. They they've made an idol of themselves. <laughs> and, and and I think what I think what I mean I think what we find out about is like if pretty much you investigate at least in modern culture, if you investigate any of these people that set themselves up as idols of religiousness, they're almost all of them are frauds. <laughs> yeah, at some level, at some level, I think that they are. Even though some of them, I, I'll just say, some of them have done good and accomplished good. Uh, <clears throat> it's not necessarily to their credit. It's I always oh no God. God, God can still use them. He God does. can still use them, but they, I mean. I mean, jeez, Louise! I was watching something on these these televangelists yeah. who have. I've watched. I'm not going to name any names because I don't know what the legal issues are. But I've I was watching this documentary on like these televangelists that have like their own planes and like 18 million dollar mansions and yeah, get it, out of here, get out of here. <laughs> you know, you know who I'm talking about. And I mean, I I just I wanted to pull my hair out. Yeah, yeah. There's a category of them that fit that description. More than one. Even if you can't get some. Oh, this is a lesson four now. If you're following at home in your in your books, a lesson four. Even if you can't get someone to follow you, you can at least get them to notice you, which is kind of an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, and then I have my, kind of like a, a, a my own little questions here. Can you really? Can you? or me, really turn a person into a Christian. And the best we can do, I think, is to get the person to take notice of our witness of Christ. The best testimony, however, is not a testimony about the miracles that happened in our lives. Well, I've seen Jesus. You know, I've had uh, uh, these discussions with Christ. Uh, I've seen visions. God has done this and that for me. These really aren't the best kind of testimonies, but rather the best testimony is about our character and how God has shaped us and changed us. How God has made me wealthy and famous is not a testimony of the power of Christ, but how he changed my character, making more humble, more innocent, more forgiving, more loving, and even more generous. That is a testimony of my character. And I don't think we should lose track of that. We need to show how God has accomplished His grace in our character or in our spirit. Not always by healing us or physically giving us great miracles. The physical healing is important, but it's only a sign of what is possible for us inwardly. The outward bodily healing is just something done to show God can heal. So if I can heal your body, can you imagine what I could do to your soul and your spirit? And we've lost track of that. We've kind of focused just on the external healing. But all that is only a sign of what God can do internally. Uh, the body will only last for a small period of time, but the spirit and the soul last forever. So, onward. Some I would I, I would say this. I do think individuals like you and me and Kierkegaard make the Christian position an intellectual option for individuals. If we weren't out there doing what we were doing, I think people could write off Christianity wholesale as being full of hucksters and holy rollers and 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 kind of devoid of real thinking men. Yeah. And, and, and women. hopefully that we're doing something to alter that opinion to let people know yeah. there really is a true Christianity. Uh, yeah. Still, yeah. still. Sometimes when we try to, he says that sometimes when we try to compel someone to believe, we wind up making them bitter towards us and towards our cause. But they do take notice of our character by our genuine martyrdom. He says that one of the biggest problems with pastors or preachers in Christendom, which is the false Christianity or the imitation of it, is that they live under this illusion and they're looking for adherents for the sake of increasing their wealth or size of their congregation. They're not even careful if these are true believers or not. And we were just saying yeah. that in our own words, Kierkegaard noticed it. They don't, yeah. they don't care. They don't care. <laughs> uh, my own complaint is that there are so many who want to lead people to Christ, but few who want to teach them the deeper things about their faith. 
it's kind of like get them in the door, get them to confess. Now they're Christians. Now I'm moving on to the next batch of new newbies. And th th there's something that's been missing for my entire life, Luke, in, in that growth process of, okay, now that I'm a Christian, who do I go? Where do I get growth? And nobody could point me in the right direction to that. Uh, even self-admittingly, well, we're not here for that. All we're here for is to bring people into the church. So, uh, regarding the teaching of the priesthood of Melchizedek, a very interesting character. Someday we'll get a chance to talk about him. You, you <laughs> taught me. You taught me about him. <laughs> Somewhat, a little bit at a time. Yeah. No. 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 You were the very first person to introduce this this character of Melchizedek in, into my into my life, and it it really expanded my mind. That's like I think that was a real mind expanding oh. moment when you told me about okay. him. <laughs> well, I, thank you. I appreciate that. It's always good to know that I've had an effect on some. Uh, but also for the record, I'm insane. So <laughs> yeah. it's you might you might have started this uh, this current s state of sustained insanity. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, even though we take that character that we talked about there, and and he we find him in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament. He says that the teachers need teachers because they're still babes in their thinking. They've not grown beyond the very basics of becoming a Christian. Now, for people who say, Bob, you know, you're getting way out. Keep yourself limited to Scripture. I'm going to read a Scripture from Hebrews that discusses this issue. That is there something beyond just saying, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior? Is there something beyond that? Well, Hebrews says, yes, there is. He says in six, chapter 6, verses 1 through 3, of the American Standard Version. He says, Wherefore, leaving the doctrine of the first principles of Christ, let us press on unto perfection, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the preaching of baptisms and the laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permit. So even the author of Hebrew scolded the people of his community, saying, okay, you guys are saved, move on. Head towards perfection. That's your job. And uh, so just to let you know that I'm, I'm still in context here with the scriptures. So Kierkegaard continues. He calls this vain conceit and says that they are in purely aesthetic categories. They use aesthetic works to captivate their audience. And I, in parentheses, put sounds, lights, mannerisms, gesticulations. These are all part of the aesthetic world. But now, what do they do with all those who have accepted the aesthetic version of Christ? So once you've brought people into this aesthetic world of Christianity, what do you do with them? There are many in Christendom, he says, who try to assure themselves that they are Christians. There is a confusion here in that they already are Christians rather than that they believe themselves to be Christians. How then can you convert or reconvert a Christian to Christianity? So, what he's saying here is that how do we approach the Christians from Christendom, meaning those people who have maybe given a little piece of the gospel uh, and have now believed they're Christians but maybe not necessarily are, how do we approach them directly since they do not think that they are not Christians, in his words? So these people are convinced that I was born, I was baptized as an infant, and I'm a Christian, so I don't need to worry about anything anymore. My character doesn't matter. My behavior doesn't matter. I know I have this diploma, of, well, not a diploma, this, this certificate of baptism, and it says I've been baptized into the body of Christ, so what, why do I need to do anything else? Well, let, let me, let's just, let's, let's play a little ping pong here. <laughs> okay. uh, I want, because, because, you know, because this is a, a deep, this could open up a lot, a, a, a deep the, theological, philosophical conversation. And, and I'm sure you've thought about it and I just want you to weigh in on it for a second. Okay. Yes. Okay. 
I can understand from Kierkegaard's perspective, from what I understand of his general corpus, the reason why he would want an intensification of of what we're calling, you know, Christian religiousness, mm-hmm. right? To go deeper than just getting in the door, getting the diploma, getting baptized, or whatever else, is that so in general, there is a, I guess, there is something more serious about Christendom that can be more attractive to the outsider, but also for what it can do for the inner life of the individual so that they're not just still trapped in a set of categories, that they have recourse to religious resources and spiritual development that will better help them deal with existential despair and anxiety and angst and things of that nature. But this raises a very interesting question about salvation Mm -hmm. and even what salvation means, right? So these Christians, these aesthetic Christians who you know, got their diploma, did their little dunk in the tank or whatever, right? Yeah. Had a real, they went and saw a really cool light show and a bunch of dreamy hunks singing about God, you know, when they're rock band, right? Um, You know, Kierkegaard's not going to want to say that those individuals are not saved, is he? I mean, is, I mean, and if he is, I mean, how can we possibly have that sort of internal scrutiny? Mm -hmm. And then, is there any question of becoming more or less saved in this existential development? Or is it really just about how we can better live out the Christian ideal and be more at one with our eternal abode and, and not so much incongruous in, in, in temporal categories? Do you understand what I'm trying to say here? Yes. Is, is like, Kierkegaard's not trying to say that those individuals aren't saved, or is he? He's what, not, what do you I, think? I, I don't think he wants to mess with that question. Because, first of right. all, if he does, he's going to turn the people off. And you know him, he doesn't want to do that. He wants to get the reader to read on, to read forward. If he starts. Well, sometimes he wants to, sometimes he wants to turn them off, sometimes he wants to offend them, right? He, he, he oscillates he does. between he plays seducing them, he plays them and offend them. them. Yeah. Yeah. But I yeah. think if he played that, that would be too. That would be like a, a game. Killer, if, if he started to talk about that. The way I look at it, Luke, is that uh, lately I can say, let's split it into two groups. Let's split it, the aesthetic believer and the religious believer. And, <coughs> excuse me, whether or not, and I think it does, translates to those who are called and those who are chosen, which is mm. more of a biblical go, go response. Go on, go on, go on. Give me more, give me more. Okay. God calls many, as Jesus said, which has always been a very difficult verse for me to interpret, which I think I have more of a grasp on it now. Many are called, but only few are chosen. I what, think... Th- th- what, where, what, for, what verse is that? Oh, it's, it's in the Gospel. I can't, I can't quote you the right. uh, chapter and verse I'll, on it. I'll, I'll look it up while you're, you're explaining uh, the distinction. Okay. It's, I'm not even sure that we need a distinction. I think just the mere hearing of the words lets us know and ask ourselves the question, am I called or am I chosen? Which do I want to be? Do I want to be with the many and be the called? Or do I want to be with the chosen and be the few? And I think that's the question that we have. That, that's more of an existential question that does not have an answer, let's say. But let's say they are categories. Maybe it is those who are called are those who hear the word of God as like the seeds. The seeds go out and the ones that immediately hear the word of God begin to grow. What may happen to them is that temptation may come in and uh, steal away the seeds before they get a foothold. Or they may be scorched by the sun. The challenges of life may be too much for them. So I tend to see those as the called. The chosen are those who get beyond that, who seek, seek something deeper, not just their own salvation. It's not, you know, I, I tend to think people who just want to be saved are like, say, just save my skin and that's all I want. Rather than, what can I do for you now, Lord? You know, how can I serve you? How can I repay you if it's even possible for my salvation? That, I think, is a sign that we're chosen. So the question would be, the existential would be to ask people, do you want to be just called or do you want to be called and chosen? And so that's what I would... Did you find the chapter and verse on that? 
Yeah, it's Matthew twenty two fourteen, and I'm 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 trying to quickly surmise the it's it's within in the nature of a parable. There's something about a wedding. Um, yeah, he says it in several maybe, places too, um, and it's never really completely clear what he's talking about there. How he relates it to the faith, and even Paul doesn't necessarily relate it. So I'm I'm giving it a shot here. Uh, hopefully, I've I've come close to it. Uh, it's so he, it's just it's it just very. I mean, I'm not saying it's we. It's just very interesting to think about that there would be in, individuals who would. With a hundred percent authenticity, say I am Christian, and then possibly not even be saved. I, you know, but we'll, we'll address that for yeah. For somebody to say I just want to be called, I don't want to be chosen. I can't imagine them being a, a bona fide Christian. But I, it's not up to me; it's up to God. <laughs> right, it is. It is. So he he goes on to say that uh, to reach those in Christendom, you cannot use a direct or a straightforward method, but you have to use an indirect method. The reason is because they're living under an illusion. So those people that maybe you talked about there with the light show and that, they may be living in an illusion of one kind or another. Uh, what is the illusion? Does he believe that they're not really Christians? I In my own notes, I even asked that question. This might be true, but I think that it's more that they're not mature Christians. Many of them, including pastors, remained in childish uh, or make-believe thinking about Christ. <coughs> Perhaps even their faith is make-believe. I'm sure that there are some who are baptized in Denmark and lived without confessing Christ would not be Christians. But I think his audience is wider than just those. So, yes, I think he's speaking to a mixture in Christendom. A mixture of those who really are Christians but don't want anything to do with it. And those who are Christians and are more interested to say, where do I go from here? How do I become a better Christian? <coughs> well, you know, what, you know what's interesting is... You know, er, earlier I alluded to that Kierkegaard wants this intensification of Christian religiousness, um, and he's not speaking about it so much from salvation terms on, you know, the eternal perspective, that there might be reasons for this in terms of existential mood states. But if that's the case, Kierkegaard is a terrible representative of this whole idea, right? Because he's so incredibly melancholic, right? Because of the the upbringing that he had. He's not exactly, <laughs> I mean, really, as far as gloomy Danes go, I mean, <laughs> it's like him and Hamlet are fighting for that number <laughs> number one and number two slot, right? Yeah. Like, they're both pretty miserable wretches. Yeah. So, I, I, I guess, um, I guess what I'm saying is, is that even is that even a true assessment? What I said earlier, or is Kierkegaard thinking more along the lines like there's the passage in I believe is it in Revelation where Jesus says I don't want you lukewarm I I, I will spew the lukewarm out of my mouth like that he's That's really right. trying to create That's right. That's, yes he does those who are lukewarm I'll spit you out of my mouth I'll vomit you right. out of my mouth uh, right because he wants people. <sighs> So then that does bring in issues of salvation again. Yeah, but it does. But again, we, we leave it to God who spits out who he wants to spit out. We can only warn right. people. We can just warn people and give them the message. They they have the responsibility. How the word works upon them is <clears throat> between them and the Holy Spirit. Right. Uh, so he says that he must begin a, as an aesthetic writer while truly being the religious writer, but appearing as the aesthetic writer. So he calls this incognito. Uh, right. He admits that this indirect method might be a deceptive method, but it's justified in a special way. The aesthetic work is a deception, and this is the deeper reason for the pseudonyms. <coughs> so he admits that he's being slightly deceptive in what he's saying here in order to get people to listen to him. Uh, but what if he's trying to deceive others into truth, like Socrates, his, his uh, beloved philosopher. I'm not sure, Luke, if I would agree with this philosophy in deceiving one into the truth, which is somewhat putting it in, in uh, you know, a little more curt, but, but he's, he's really deceiving people into the truth. So I'm not really sure at this point, as I was reading, whether I would agree that it's 
It's okay to do that. Is it okay to tell a lie if you're going to bring a person into Christ? I, I, I don't see that that's... I don't want to say possible, well, but I say I don't see myself as ever doing that because I hold to the truth so much. I don't want to enter into lies because then I think I damage the whole, the whole uh, gospel. But what do you think? I certainly can't do it. I don't know. I don't know how to lie. In fact, I. But I, I see the utility in what Kierkegaard's saying because, yes, you know, Bob and I were having a conversation off camera earlier, and I was just like, "Oh man!" Like, I I wish all my life someone had just presented evidence to me and given me proofs and da 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 da. da. And so I think about that in terms of how I go out into the world and I try to demonstrate things to people because that's what I wanted my entire life. I didn't didn't need any deception. I was I was beset with deception all over the place. I wanted I wanted some truth. And that's why I ended up studying philosophy. And well, then I found that that, that form of truth let, you know, didn't really get the job done. Mm -hmm. um, I think the interesting question to ask here is, is, is Kierkegaard lying? You know, it, is, he, is he lying? I don't think he is. I don't think he's lying. Um, being deceptive is is a form of a lie, you might say. Uh, maybe he's not verbally lying, but it's it's presenting something that really isn't true. However, I don't think he brings it to that point. But I just wanted to make it clear in case somebody says, "Well, if Kierkegaard could do it, I can do it too," because I'll tell you what I think. Like, <coughs> it, like when, when like when when an author writes a like. Sartre, when he wrote No Exit, was Sartre lying? No, because he made it obvious that this was a story. Let me give you an example. Right. <coughs> I've heard many pastors tell stories from the pulpit that weren't true. And they never told the people they weren't true. They made the, they made the congregation believe that these are, are beautiful stories that happened, but they never really happened. They're fictional, but they yeah, were they I, they motivated people to believe or to give more money or to do whatever. But they weren't true, so I can't do that. No. Yeah, you see, and that this is kind of an illusion that that was he lying? Well, it may not be at that bright line, you know, where you can say this is a lie, this is a, you know, this is the truth. But he's certainly on the edge of lying when. You deceive people, and you know that they're accepting this story as true when it isn't true. But come on, if you have two brain cells, you know, you know, there's like a willful suspension of disbelief, right? Like when you read the seducer's diary, you know, you know it's not real. Like you know, yeah, you you you, you kind of get lost in it, right? It's like. It's like when you go, like it's like when I went and saw like a community performance of of uh, of uh, Mary Poppins, yeah, right, yeah. Like there were all sorts of set malfunctions and bad props and bad makeup because they don't have any budget or whatever. Uh -huh. But I willfully suspend my discernment of those things so I can enjoy it. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. and so if you have like two brain cells, you're just like, I'm going to dial down, like, I'm going to dial down the rational scrutiny and open up my imagination so I can enjoy this aesthetic work, mm -hmm. whether it be Mary Poppins or The Seducer's Diary. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I'm a grown up and I know that Mary Poppins is just a, it's, it's just a story and that this thing that I just read wasn't autobiography. Mm -hmm. So I think he, I don't think he's a liar. And I don't know, I, I, I think he just, uh, I think I think he presumes that the reader will willfully engage in the suspension of disbelief, like we do when we go to the movies or something. Like, I don't think Transformers is real. <laughs> Actually, I think it's kind of real. But, you know, I used to not think it was real. Yeah. <laughs> well, Hika, let's continue on here and let's see what he has to say about this. Because now, All right, now, yeah. now that I built up the suspense, let's see if I can... I can uh, uh, give you a conclusion. <clears throat> He's now trying to bring one into the truth, out from the illusion. 
if he is in an illusion, you must first remove the illusion, for it stands in the way of truth. So this is how he looked at what he was doing. He was trying to bring the person out from an illusion. And in order to do that, he had to use that deception. But what does he mean by deception? <laughs> so let's look at page 40, at the bottom of page 40. What then does it mean to deceive? It mean that, means that one does not begin directly with the matter one wants to communicate, but begins by accepting other man's illusion as good money. So, to stick to the theme with which this work especially deals, one does not begin thus, colon, I am a Christian, you are not a Christian. Not does one begin thus, colon, it is Christianity I am proclaiming, and you are living in a purely aesthetic category. No, one begins this way. Let us talk about ethic, uh, aesthetics. The deception consists in the fact that one talks thus merely to get to the religious theme, but on our assumption, the other man is under the illusion that the aesthetic is Christianity, for he thinks, I am a Christian, and yet he lives in aesthetic categories. So, <clears throat> trying to summarize that, what he's saying is that if he's speaking to somebody who can only see things in an aesthetic manner, to jump in and start saying, well, I'm a Christian and you're not because you're in the aesthetic world, he says, you're not going to get anything that way. So he says, what you do is you kind of level down with them. You come in and you present yourself as an aesthetic. And then when you win their uh, confidence that you're not judging them, then you can bring them up to a higher level. So that's how he uses the illusion along with deception. Whether or not we consider that to be you know, valid or not, at least this is how he's looking at it. So we have to begin where someone is. We must see life from the point of view, from this point of view, or from their point of view, actually, in order to help them. Now, I don't know, have you ever studied psych, uh, psychology? You must have studied some psychology, right? Stay a little of everything, Bob. Oh, I'm sure you did. Because uh, you're, you're a man of letters, a man of many letters. Uh, so, uh, but this is this, this is book that I read that I thought was extremely interesting. It's called Existential Psychotherapy, and it was written oh. written by a doctor, Irvin Yalom, Y A L O M. If you're interested in existentialism and psychotherapy, he he gives us a, a, he merges the two together very well, very well. And judging from his name, he's a, he's a Jewish man. He's not a Christian man. So there's not a lot of Christianity here. But it gives you psychotherapy, which is extremely... I think that psychology is so important for uh, anybody who's a Christian teacher to understand. To try to understand how the mind functions is extremely important for anybody who's a teacher. So I just thought it was something I, I went into for a while to try to get a grasp of my own insanity as well as everybody else's. Um, just to, while we're on the topic of that, for anyone who's interested, there is actually, I believe, an 11 or 12 part uh, audio book on YouTube for Carl Jung's Man and His Symbols that I just recently finished. And uh, I found that to be uh, very helpful on a number of levels as well, especially in understanding culture and religion and and addressing uh, modern psychotherapy movements. So um, I, I just throw that into the mix. It's a free resource out there that I think you know everyone should be familiar with Carl Jung, and it's it's brilliant. It's out there. It's free. You should go take it. Check it out. Okay. If we were to begin by well, let's see. I think I already did that. Uh, Okay, uh, let me read this again because it's important. If we were to begin by saying that I am a Christian and you're not, and that you're deceiving yourself into thinking you're a Christian, this would not work in pragmatics, but would rather polarize the other person against your ideas and against your arguments. To say I'm on one side of the line and you're not <clears throat> is automatically to polarize. And I've run into this in the world 
uh, where I tell others that I'm, when I say to people I'm a Christian, and they respond by saying, well, yeah, I'm a Christian too. Yet I see in the way they're behaving and what they're doing, and sometimes what's on their Facebook pages, uh, and realize... Are you talking about me? Are you talking about me? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not this time, Luke, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that that they're living in an aesthetic world, an aesthetic life, and not in the life of truth and humility. Uh, and if I were to challenge them, however, right off, they'd push back and accuse me of judging them. Yeah, yeah, I get, yeah, you, you'll get that a lot. Yeah, <laughs> he says that. I, oh, go ahead. Here's what, here's my impersonation of of whenever that happens to me. I just feel so judged. <laughs> <laughs> so judged yes well I, I try to avoid putting people in that position and I think that's what Kierkegaard did too he says that he's convinced that Socrates was a Christian even though Christ existed after him then I'm not sure whether I agree with him personally I'm not sure that we can put Socrates in that category I'm not saying I won't put him in the category. He said that he said that he became a Christian, not that he was. He became a Christian. Became a Christian, and I think I I, I like that idea. I like you know why I like this idea. Go ahead. Is because because I like the way it's almost like Kierkegaard is advocating this idea that God used Socrates to 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 level. The intellectual playing field that, like, God introduced Socrates into history, so that Socrates would go around and 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 deflate all these pagan conceptions of God and justice and everything else, and then there would be nothing remaining, and then bam, here comes Christ. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I and I like I like to think about it. I mean, I could be wrong, and I could be putting words into Kierkegaard's mouth, but it's all it's it's like. God is using certain individuals in order to bring about the fulfillment of prophecy. And they don't necessarily have to be Christians or Jews themselves. And also, and also I like this idea that Socrates was given a chance to accept Jesus in Abraham's bosom or wherever he would have gone. Mm -hmm. If he would, you know, yeah. I don't know if he would have gone to Abraham's bosom. I know the Old Testament saints went there, but... You know, I like the idea that, that Socrates or maybe some kid who grows up in Laos who's never heard of Jesus Christ has a chance. Mm -hmm. Well, judging from the church fathers, many of them were uh, more, more Socratic in their thinking. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, that was a big issue early on in the church. Is they had to figure out how much of Neoplatonism and, was, and Gnosticism were going to be a part of Christian doctrine. Yeah. It took a while for them to sort that yeah, out. Yeah, there was a merging of philosophy and Christianity. The The end result was, uh, I'm not sure how, how to even define it, but uh, it, it was a, what, what could we call it? What could we call the merging? Luke, you got, you're, you're a man of good words. Uh, well, I, I use the word syncretization. That would but, be a good word for it. Uh, yeah, but, you know, um, what was I going to say? A hybrid. Keep going. Uh, I, I, I think I was yeah. thinking more of a hybrid where it wasn't really purely Christian and it wasn't really purely philosophy. It was, a, it was a blending of the two that I'm not so sure did either one a favor. Uh, I think it reduced both of them. It was trying to compromise Christianity to make Christianity more believable, which actually uh, Karl Barth had this theory that Christianity always follows philosophy. It always is looking for philosophy to bless it. And so it's always yeah. trying to, to live up to philosophy, use philosophical terms to define itself so that it would be accepted by the world of philosophy. I, be, I, I agree with him on that. Do you, would you say that you would agree? Well, it does that, but it does it at its own peril because then you get hitched. It's you're unequally yoked. Then, you're, then, you're, then you've got Christian doctrine married to this, these secular ideas about the universe. And... and, and and whenever that trade-off is made, it, it's a short-term advance. Yeah, you might gain some converts, but in the long run, the implications are absolutely crazy. They are. Absolutely. And 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 um, you know, I, and I, I experience this a lot because 
and I'm not going to go into it here because I'm not I'm not interested in risking my credibility at this point. But um, I think it is very important to remember the phrase that Pascal had sewed into his jacket that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Joseph is is not the God of the philosophers, and like. All my life, I was using philosophy to try to get to Jesus. Yeah. And I, it doesn't work. It doesn't work because, because man's secular philosophy will lead you committed to certain doctrines mm-hmm. that you, mm-hmm. you, you cannot integrate with Christianity. No. You, you, might be, you might be able to rationally get to the plausibility of God, but you will never rationally prove through philosophy or <laughs> science Jesus Christ. And Luke, that's, you know? that's, what, that's what this whole thing about Kierkegaard's leap is about. It's a leap of faith. There's no bridge that you can get from here to there. Philosophy is not the bridge that gets us from here to there. And Kierkegaard knew this. And he knew Kierkegaard that. Kierkegaard knew this. He knew it. And he, he, and he, he, you know, a lot of people were really excited about Hegelianism. They're oh. like, oh, Hegel's going to do it for us. Hey, <laughs> Hegel's going to get us to Christ. You know, he's, he's, Hegel's going to comprehend the totality of every thought, every man ever thought, you know, and he's going to be, and like, God is just going to come through Hegel and tell us everything. Mm-hmm. Well, Hegel, and, yeah, he went, instead of a bridge, he built a, uh, a Tower of Babel because he, he, oh, yeah, he, yeah, but he's indecipherable. Yeah, yeah. So okay, so now we enter into another one of his works called the Postscript. Uh, so this, anyway, so he continues on. So this presents the problem of becoming a Christian. This is why he created synonymous authors. He says to help a person to become a Christian by luring them away from the aesthetic life. So can we speculate about the many things such as? Uh, well, I have now like flying saucers and alien beings, and I'm sure you can fill in the blanks with other things that we speculate about. <laughs> oh, I can I talk about all that stuff at length. <laughs> I know. But this can, this can lead to speculation about Christ. I, Go ahead. I just, want, I just want to direct people to Ezekiel's wheel. <laughs> okay. But also, I want to say I don't believe in aliens. Okay. Uh, but this kind of thinking, this kind of speculation can create speculation about Christ as well. Because speculation is almost like a, a way of life, uh, and it never ends. Uh, he advises us to take our mind out of these things. It's not through speculation that we can come to truth. It's through self-reflection. So we need to turn our efforts inwards to examine ourselves. And this is this was spoke really loudly to me because this is what I did through my life, uh, is that everything external became a failure, and never failed to get me from here to there. So that's when I started to look inward, and I realized the one most important thing that I could say about self reflection is that truth begins with ourself. We have to first see who we truly are in order to be able to listen, in order to be able to understand the truth outside. If we can't accept the truth of who we really are, then we can't accept truth anywhere. And that truth doesn't come merely by self-reflection, but comes from God's illumination and self-reflection. The two must happen together because we, we can't find truth in ourselves. All we can find in ourselves is that speculation and failure to find the truth. And thanks to God's illumination of what is truth, that He is truth, that's what brings us to that point of Christianity, that point of exception. So through self-reflection, we don't find the truth, but what we do find is the lack of it, which in itself is a truth, paradoxically. If right, right, right. But hey, I'll say this. For a long time, I understood that I didn't have all the answers, mm-hmm. right? But so I, I knew for a long time that I was in untruth about the objective truth. Yeah. Okay? But... I don't think I understood just how 
I don't think I understood just how sinful I was. I was like, you know, I'm a pretty good person. I, I don't think I understood how far away I was from God's holiness. And I, so, you know, I think the illumination, if God does choose us in that way to reference the Matthew twenty two fourteen. I think it's. I think nearly every human go can go. Oh, I don't have the truth. You know, like I think any, you know, honest person can say that, and that they don't know God. And but I, I think when God really chooses you, it's got to be in this place of. To- it's weird. It's almost like you have to really be brought to your knees. You do. You have to like. You have to be brought to your knees and like that. Just know that you are just utter filthiness. Yeah. You know. Well, well, the the it's not e- it's not even that like you're pretty good and like you kind of know some stuff. It's like I know nothing and everything I do is wrong. Mm-hmm. And that's like I can't. That's not like a great like. Cur- that's not like a great PR campaign for Christianity. Yeah. But I think that's kind of how. I think that's kind of how it works. At least that's kind of how it worked for me. Like I was, you know, I was shown this year just. Man, how far away, <laughs> how far away I was from uh, understanding the true nature of reality and God's perfection. Well, oh, was yeah. very, you know. Okay, I can't give you chapter and verse. I think it's around chapter 5 or 6 in Matthew. But Jesus says, the eye is the light of the body. But if the light of, if the, if the, light of the body is darkness, how great is that darkness? So oh, yeah. this idea that if what we see, we if if we can't see anything, we're living in darkness, and what we see is darkness. And if that's the light of the body, how great is that darkness? That's why we need the illumination of God. So all, it's, all yeah, it's yeah, it's like I had spiritual cataracts, and then God did like divine LASIK on me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Putting it in like, modern uh, terms, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So one must reflect upon themselves in a different way than we are currently doing. So what does this mean to us today, Luke? Now I'm going to do this point here, and then when we get a little further, I'm almost reaching the end of today's uh, today's little episode here but i wanted to get through this so what does it mean this mean to us today how do we update kierkegaard's idea is there an aesthetic part of the church that we might call christendom today and how do we identify it so what are some of the uh, yes. what are some of the aesthetic things about the church by aesthetic and i should say this again we're talking about the sensual things does the church have a sensual part that has this kind of alluring phase of it uh, that kind of dis- uh, draws us into it uh, this sensuality of the church C- yeah. can, can you tell me some things that might be in the church today well I mean I I mean today I mean I think last week I sort of mentioned it with like you know the contemporization of the church through the spectacle of rock bands, you know, but, and, and then I mentioned maybe the, the blues music of snake handling Appalachian churches and mm-hmm. stuff, but specifically right now, because we're coming up on, on Christmas, you know, Christmas trees, the whole season, I might, my, the, yeah. the whole se- the, the the church that I grew up in, you know, like, they 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 decorate a Christmas tree and it's a big fun thing for everyone. Yeah. But like, it's pretty explicit in Jeremiah that we're not supposed to do that. Mm-hmm. That this, and that we're supposed to not be like bringing trees into the worship <laughs> thing. Like this is a pretty obviously a pagan thing that ought not to be there. And they go out and they sing Christmas carols and maybe they'll sing away in the manger and then they'll sing. Rudolph the red nose reindeer. And how about and how, like, how about if the pastor dresses up as Santa Claus and gives his sermon dressed up as Santa Claus? You mean Satan Claus? <laughs> you mean the guy dressed in red that is a, that we tell all the children about, and then they grow up and they're like, "Oh yeah, that was just a fairy tale," but Jesus is real. No doubt, Jesus. 
Oh, that doesn't mess with a young person's mind at all. Not at all. They don't go, oh, well, Jesus. They're like, when I grew up, we did Easter egg hunts in the church, and we and we talked about getting gifts from Santa, and and we talked about Jesus. And then I, and then I became 18 years old, and I was like, well, the Easter Bunny was a fairy tale. Santa was a fairy tale. But Jesus is real? Mm-hmm. Nah, he was probably a fairy tale too. I'm an, I'm an agnostic now. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I think that we've done a lot of damage. Uh, but that's, you know, that's my opinion. Apparently your opinion as well. But now the harder thing is, Luke, how do we, if, if we look at the aesthetic church, and we could go on and on and on about the aesthetic, and it's what pleases us, what makes us, what makes us enjoy kind of the pleasure of going to church and so forth. Not even just going to church, but other things as well. But, but what is a religious church then? If we now identify the, the aesthetic church and we want to change the aesthetic church into a religious church, what do we, how do we define the religious church? How, what kind of words would you uh, use? It's, it's uh, my opinion and your opinion, and we should just take it over and run it our way. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> ask the qu- I'm sorry. Can you, you ask you, the question you, again? You, I, you, I, you, I, I felt like you set me up for a joke. No, actually, I, I, you kind of drew me into that. I, I thought. Uh, okay, so if, if we're looking at the religious church and we're con- we, we are making a uh, comparison between the aesthetic church and a religious church, and now we know what the aesthetic church is, what is a religious church? Is it just removing the things of the aesthetic church? As though when we remove things, we'll be left with the true church. Uh, no, that- because you could still you could still have some. You know, we could take away the rock band. We could take away the uh, the the Christmas tree. And if you still have like a preacher up there who's like who's like aesthetically sermonizing, Perf- right? You mean performing? Like, performing. Te- Performing, yeah, telling these fake stories, right? Like, oh, I, I was sitting next to a woman at a bus stop, and I told her life was like a box of chocolates. And like, no, you didn't. That was that's a scene from Forrest Gump. That never happened to you. Yeah. So if they're still lying going on in the pulpit, um, I don't know. You know, I think about it a lot. You know, I li- I every day I try to listen. To, uh, there's this great channel on youtube called christian audio books and something i can't I, it's escaping me right now but they um they uh i've mentioned this before but i listen i try to listen to one of these puritan sermons every day and i'm like oh man the puritans had it figured out because they had you know spurgeon and octavius winslow and aw pink you're proud you probably don't like i don't know if you like that stuff i like that stuff so if i had a church i'd have it like a puritan church i guess i'd be living in the scarlet letter According to my own standards, I go around putting A's on people. I'm crazy. Uh, okay, but <laughs> you no, know, I don't know. I don't know. I like those sermons. I feel okay. like those sermons are legit. I like those sermons. I feel like those sermons are totally legit. Okay. I don't. We don't necessarily have to wear pilgrim clothes, but I like those Puritan sermons. I think it looked pretty cool in a pilgrim outfit, Luke. Myself, I think uh, it- they had some pretty cool, pretty cool hats. Pretty cool hats. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah, and the bibs cool. Okay, but the way I would <laughs> the way I would re- define the religious church, I would say it's true holiness. It's our pursuit of true holiness would be the religious church. I think Yukaga would agree with me about that. I hope he would anyway. Uh, that what we're trying to do is take people from the superficiality of the church and bring them into the purest, holiest form of the church. And somehow, somebody has to try to do that. And I can tell you from my personal experience, it's not an easy bridge to lead people over uh, from one side to the other. Uh, so how can... What do you think... Of, what, what do you think pure... What do you think holy sermons look like? What... what? Because I'll, I'll... Like, earlier I was just kind of like name-dropping some individuals that... You know, like I like a Spurgeon. I understand. And, yeah, like, what what do you what do you who do you who do you who do you think does it right? Um, well, I'm I'm terrible with names. There are people, even some. I don't like to use the word televangelist, but there are some that are very good. Um, uh, 
maybe their names will come to me a little bit later. But I, that's okay. My, my my way of of looking at it would be: What would a sermon look like? It would be a sermon about Jesus. It would always focus about Jesus. Focusing on the Sermon on the Mount would be the epitome of the the religious sermon. What religious sermon would best represent the religious uh, stage or phase would be the Sermon on the Mount. And everything should take that sermon and just grow from that sermon so that it could always point back to that sermon again. Where everything helped an individual to come to a greater sense of holiness about God and a desire for holiness within themselves, not self-righteousness. Holiness is not self-righteousness. The way I explain it is that the vessels in the in the Old Testament, the vessels in the uh, in the temple, were made holy, which meant they were fit for use in the temple. They didn't have a self-righteousness, obviously, they're inanimate objects, but through the, the process of purification, the vessels became usable in the temple. We have to become cleansed so that we become usable in the temple. We have to look at ourselves that way. We have to be made holy. We have to want to be made holy. And that's the religious aspect. So we have those that are sitting enjoying their salvation, uh, enjoying their blessings. There's nothing wrong with, with that. But who have no desire to go into the state of holiness. Okay? So that's how I would kind of def define the two uh, as to what was aesthetic and what was uh, religious. So I will end there today. Uh, we're at page 44. The next one we'll do is titled is a title called The Difference in My Personal Mode of Existence Corresponding to the Essential Difference in the Works. And then we're going to go into how he actually lived his life and how he tried to almost mime or pantomime what he was doing in as an author to, to, to live that life, making the transition from the aesthetic into the religious in his real life and uh, into the community. So that'll be interesting next week. Dope. Thank you, Bob. That was a riveting lesson, as usual. Thank you, Luke. You know, I, no one quite does it like you, my friend. <laughs> Thank you for the compliment. Appreciate it. All right, everyone. I got to go back to being a CEO guy. So okay. I got to figure out how to... I gotta figure out how to make the website and the app work better. Thank you, Bob. You're Thank you, everyone, for listening. And um, oh, any questions? Yeah, if anybody has any comments or questions, just list them there on YouTube somewhere or on the app, so that we can get a little feedback. Help us know how we're yeah, doing so and how to direct us. You can email me at philosophyluke at gmail dot com, uh, and you can email me at uh, kingdomauthor at gmail dot com. Your your email sounds a lot more regal than mine. <laughs> I mean, it might need an email update. Yeah, you're the boss, so you got to have a better one. That's not right that I have a better one than you. <laughs> My new email is going to be Dr. Philosopher CEO Luke at <laughs> gmail.com. <laughs> okay, there you go. But for now, it's philosophyluke at gmail.com until I go through with such a narcissistic fantasy. All right. I'm going to edit this audio. It'll be up later tonight. Thanks, Bob. Thank you.